Hello and welcome back. Choosing the most secure browser depends on various factors, including the browser's built-in security features, its update frequencies, the availability of security extensions, and the browser's track record in addressing vulnerabilities. Let's talk about how you can choose the most secure browser for you. Now, once choosing the browser, the first thing that you should look at is to check for regular updates. Security vulnerabilities are frequently discovered in browsers, so it's crucial to choose a browser that receives regular updates. Browsers like Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, and Microsoft Edge typically provide frequent security updates to patch vulnerabilities and improve security. You should also look for built-in security features. Evaluate the built-in security features offered by the browser. Features like sandboxing, which isolates each tab or process from the rest of the system, can help prevent malware attacks. Similarly, built-in phishing and malware protection can add an extra layer of security for your browser. Then, once you take a look at the security features, you also want to consider privacy features. Privacy features can enhance security by protecting your data from being tracked or accessed without your consent. Look for browsers that offer robust privacy features such as tracking prevention, cookie management, and options for private browsing mode. Now, many of us, when using a browser, we have different types of extensions. That's why extension support is another thing that you should look at. Browser extensions can provide additional security features such as ad blocking, script blocking, password managers, and VPN services. Choose a browser that supports a wide range of security-focused extensions and ensure that you install reputable ones only from the trusted source. Once you cover all of that, you also want to check the security track record of that specific browser. Research the browser's history of addressing security vulnerabilities. Browsers with a strong track record of promptly addressing security issues and actively engaging with security researchers are generally considered more secure. Remember, all of the browsers will eventually get hacked. The only thing that you want to look at is how fast is their response time. There are certain browsers that will patch the very next day or the same day that the vulnerability occurs, and there are other browsers that will take weeks for them to patch their browser you want to go with the one that has the fastest response time. Also, consider platform compatibility. Choose a browser that is compatible with your operating system and devices. Popular browsers like Google Chrome or Firefox are available on multiple platforms, including Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, and iOS. And towards the end, you can also evaluate the other user experience. While security is necessary, usability and user experience are also essential factors to consider. Choose a browser that meets your needs in terms of performance, speed, customization options, and user interface preferences. And lastly, stay informed. Stay informed about the latest security developments and vulnerabilities in various browsers. Subscribe to security news websites. Follow browser vendor security blocks, and participate in security communities to stay updated on emerging threats and best practices. That's how you can be one of the first people to find out about a certain potential critical vulnerability that came out for your browser that you use. Ultimately, the most secure browser for you will depend on your specific requirements and preferences. That's why you can take a look at the things that we discussed in this lecture, the tips that we gave, and you can consider all of those factors such as, for example, usability, compatibility and privacy, and then choose the best browser. Now let me show you a list of the browsers that you can consider. And here on NordVPN website, we can check the top 13 most secure browsers for your privacy in 2024. If we scroll a little bit down, we will have the list of the browsers that they discuss. For my personal use, I like to use Brave Browser because it has quite a lot of security features installed inside of it and we will actually check Brave Browser options pretty soon. But if you want to read about all of these browsers and check which of them is the best choice for you, you can read through this article, scroll all the way down and read one by one browser to see which one suits your needs the best. All right, 
that would be about it for this lecture. Thank you for watching. And in the next lecture, we're going to discuss the best browser settings that you can set whichever browser you choose. Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about browser settings. Now, since there are many browsers out there, I'm going to discuss the one that I usually use the most, which is Brave Browser. We already mentioned it in one of the previous lectures, it's one of the good browsers out there. Now, of course, the same settings will not apply to each and every browser, but you should have similar settings in Safari, in Chrome, in Firefox, or whichever browser that you use. For this example, I'm going to go with the Brave browser. All right, so what you want to do with your browser? Well, first you want to navigate to its settings. For me on the Brave browser, it is right here and then I scroll all the way down to settings. Now, settings once again will look different for everyone. But what we are all mostly interested in are privacy and security settings. Now, before I get into privacy and security settings, I want to mention a cool feature that Brave browser has. It is something called shields. If I click on it, you will see the settings of a shield. Now, what does the shield do? Well, let me show you. If I, for example, go to twitter.com, hmm, it will say JavaScript is not available. That means that shields are up for this website. Now, the shortcut for shields is this. I click on the brave icon and it says shields are up for twitter.com. And down here we can see what the shields are. So it's blocking trackers and ads, it's only connecting with HTTPS, it's blocking scripts, which results in this error message that JavaScript is not available because scripts are written in JavaScript. So if I remove blocking scripts, now it should load the page. Now, of course, Twitter is not a malicious website, so we can uncheck this. But for any other website that you visit, which you're unsure whether it is safe or not, you might want to have block scripts enabled since there could be some malicious scripts in the code of the website itself, which could hook your browser. And we're going to see an actual example of that in one or two lectures where we will showcase how a hacker can hack your browser and control it from their own machine just by you clicking on their link. Now, besides scripts, it also has block fingerprinting, which I can change from block to allow to aggressively block fingerprinting. Same goes for block cross-site cookies. I can check allow all cookies, block cross-site cookies, and block all cookies. Now, keep in mind that blocking all cookies and blocking scripts could make lots of websites not work for you, so I usually go with block cross-site cookies, and I only block scripts on websites that I do not trust. All right, now same settings are here. Under the shields, we see trackers, ads, and blocking. Check it from standard to aggressive, it's the same options. Upgrade connection to HTTPS, block scripts, block fingerprinting, and block cookies. If you have block cookies settings on your browser, you want to set it ideally to only cross-site cookies. You do not want to allow all the cookies. All right, now when I go to privacy and security, there are a few things here that we are interested in. First of all, clear browsing data. I do advise you to do this regularly because there is some cache or some data from random websites that you visited and you want to regularly clear browsing data just in case. Third party cookies we already mentioned. You want to block third party cookies since you don't really need them to visit websites. It says down here that sites can use cookies to improve your browsing experience. For example, to keep you signed in or to remember items in your shopping basket. However, these cookies are usually for running certain ads, which you really don't want to have enabled. Now, down here, there is a DNT, or send a do not track request with your browsing traffic. You want to set this on if you have this option in your browser. And if I scroll down, that would be about it for this part. The next thing is extensions. Every browser has extensions. You want to be able to manage them and see which extensions are installed. In Brave Browser, I go to Extensions and I click on Manage Extensions to see all the extensions on this Brave Browser. Currently, the only extension installed is MetaMask. All right, now if I go back, there is one more important 
thing that I want to mention, and this goes for all browsers. Notice how it says update right here. That means my browser is not up to date. This could mean that it might be vulnerable to certain vulnerabilities since I have not patched it yet. You want to always update your browser as it is one of the things that you use the most. In Brave browser to update it, I will navigate to about Brave and here it will say nearly up to date. Relaunch Brave to finish updating. So it installed or downloaded this update, but I need to relaunch Brave in order for the new update to load in. All right, and those will be some of the most important privacy and security settings, which you should pay attention to whichever browser that you're using. But number one thing is to update your browser at all times. That is the most important thing that you should do. All right, now let me close this and let me quickly show you Safari settings as well. Since I'm on Mac, I will show you quickly Safari settings and to open Safari settings, you will navigate right here on Safari and click on settings. This will open this window and there are a few things here that we should be interested in. One of those things is down here under the general settings. Open save files after downloading. You ideally want to have this off since opening files after downloading can automatically run a malware if it was not detected properly. So this is something that you want to have off. You do not want to open any files after downloading. Now, other settings include tabs, autofill, passwords, and under the passwords, you can actually manage all of your passwords for different websites, which are remembered. You will, of course, have to type in your password to do so. Under the search, it will ask you which search engine you want to use. Google is by default. And if you want to be more private, you can use DuckDuckGo. Private browsing search engine. This is the similar settings. If you uncheck this, you will be able to change it right here. If you do not want to use the same search engine for normal searching and for private browsing. All right. Now under the security, there are only two things. Fraudulent sites warn when visiting a fraudulent website, you want to have this checked and web content enable JavaScript. You want to have this checked because it will break websites if you don't. But once again, if there is a website that looks suspicious to you or a link that looks suspicious to you, you want to uncheck this to not run JavaScript. Under the privacy, there are a few things. Website tracking, prevent cross-site tracking. So you want to have this checked. Hide IP address from trackers. You want to have this checked as well. And in the private browsing, you require touch ID to view log tabs. You also want to have this checked as well. Now you can navigate to advanced settings if you want to have more options, such as for example, block all cookies, if that's what you want to do. But other than that, all of the other settings are not that important for us. And lastly, as with the Brave browser, you want to manage your extensions. And currently on the Safari, there are no extensions installed, but if you have certain extensions installed, they will be shown right here under the extensions tab. All right, so that would be about it for some of the Brave browser settings and Safari browser settings. Once again, it will be similar whichever browser that you're using. You just have to navigate your way to the correct settings. Nonetheless, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next lecture. Welcome back. Securing file downloads involves ensuring that the file is obtained from a trusted and legitimate source, as well as taking precautions to prevent malware infections or unauthorized access to your system. Let's talk about how we can securely download a file. First thing we want to do is to verify the source. Always download files from reputable and trusted sources. Avoid downloading from the unfamiliar or suspicious websites as they may contain malware or other security threats. If possible, download files directly from the official website of the software or service provider that you're using. Then you want to check the URL. Before downloading a file, carefully examine the URL of the website to ensure it matches the official website of the software or servers that you're using. Beware of phishing websites that mimic legitimate sites to trick users into downloading malicious files. And whenever possible, download files over a secure connection such as HTTPS. Secure connections encrypt the data transferred between your device 
and the website reducing the risk of interception or tampering by third parties. Now, all of this is good, but that's not the only thing we want to do. We also want to verify file integrity. Verifying file integrity comes after downloading a file. We want to verify its integrity to ensure it has not been tampered with or modified during the download process. Many websites will provide checksums or digital signatures that you can use to verify the authenticity of the downloaded files. And as usual, make sure to use antivirus software, just in case. So before opening or executing a file that you downloaded, scan it with up-to-date antivirus software to check for malware or other security threats. Antivirus software can help detect and remove malicious files that may have been injected into the software that you downloaded. Also, be cautious with email attachments. Exercise caution when downloading file attachments from email messages, especially if they are unexpected or from unknown senders. As we already know by now, email attachments are a very common vector for malware distribution, so always verify the legitimacy of the sender before downloading the attachments. And a couple more things, such as keep software updated, ensure that your operating system, web browser, and antivirus softwares are up to date with the latest security patches and updates. Regularly updating your software helps protect against known vulnerabilities that could be exploited by attackers. And if possible, enable download protection. Some web browsers and antivirus softwares offer download protection features that automatically scan downloaded files for malware or malicious content. Enable these features to add an extra layer of security to your downloads. And the last measure that we want to mention is a little bit extreme, but if you care for your security, you can start doing this and that is to use a virtual machine to execute suspicious files. If you're downloading files from potentially risky sources, consider using a virtual machine to isolate the download environment from your main operating system. Virtual machines provide a sandboxed environment that can help contain any potential security threats. All right, so by following the things that we mentioned, you can securely download files while minimizing the risk of malware infections or other security incidents. Always exercise caution and use your judgment when downloading files from the internet, as well as prioritize security over convenience. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next lecture. Welcome back. Remember when we talked about phishing, and when we mentioned that there are two layers of defense when it comes to email phishing? The first one is to recognize the email itself as a phishing email, and the second one is to recognize the website itself as a phishing website that either wants to steal your credentials or that makes you want to download a malware or any type of malicious attachment. Well, here you will see that even just by clicking on the website, you can still get hacked. So it is not always that you need to input something or that you need to download a file. Sometimes even just by clicking on the link can get you hacked. Let's see how that will look like in this live demonstration. So once again, I have my Cal Linux hacking machine right here and I have my Windows 11 target machine right here with the browser open. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to hook this browser and control it from our hacking machine. Let's see how that will look like. To do that, we're going to use a tool called beef XSS. Let's run it and it will start the beef XSS tool. This tool will help us control the target's browser. As you can see, a bunch of different things happening on the screen. Let's wait for this to finish. And once it's done, it will open this window, which is the tool itself, but on a web interface. Once we log in, with username and password, or once the hacker logs in, they will have these settings right here, offline browsers and online browsers. And once we hook a certain browser, it will appear right here in the online browsers. Let's see how that will go. Now, before we actually do that, there is some preparation that we need to do. If I scroll a little bit up, there is the hook itself. So to hook the actual target's browser, the target needs to open a web page that will have this piece of code in the HTML code of that web page. 
This is why we need to copy this and host it on our own web page. Let's copy the code. Let's navigate to our patch to web server where we have our index.html file. And if we take a look at the index.html file, you will notice that it's just a simple HTML code. It has a header and it has the paragraph right here embedded in this body. But once we add our code right here, let's say between the HTML tag and the body tag, all we're left to do is to change the IP with our Cal Linux IP address, which is in my case this one. Save this code and send the link to the target. Not the hacker could send the link anyway, like for example through the email phishing attack that we showed or through the SMS phishing attack that we also showed. There are multiple ways that the attacker can send this link and make it believable. And once the target opens the link, which we're going to demonstrate right here, it will open this web page with the first heading and first paragraph. So nothing else will happen and target will have no idea. But if I go back to my Cal Linux machine, under the online browsers, here is the target Windows machine. We successfully hooked it. And once you have it hooked, you can do various different things with this machine. For example, if I click on it, navigate the commands, here are the things that the hacker can actually do to you if you're unaware that your browser has been hooked. Let's take a look at a few different options. For example, in the browser, we can take a look at this alert dialog. So if I click on create alert dialog, I can send a message to the victim or to the target machine. Let's type, hello, your browser has been hooked. And let's put a smiley face like this. Once we execute it, if I go back to my Windows 11 machine, you can see the message is being displayed right here. Hello, your browser has been hooked and the smiley face. So you can actually see that we are successfully controlling this browser, but this is not the only thing that we can do. There are a bunch of other things that we can do. And if we were to show all of this, it will take hours to finish. So we're only going to show like two more and then we will proceed to the next lecture. Let's also take a look at the redirect module in this browser tab. So if I go down here, there is the redirect browser. So we can actually redirect the target browser to a different website. And this different website could, for example, be a phishing page that is asking for credentials or some other page that will make the target download a malware. But for this purpose, we're just going to redirect it to, let's say, Twitter. Let's say we want to redirect target to Twitter. If I execute it and go back, here it is. The browser actually got redirected to Twitter. How cool is that? All right, let's close this, go back to our page. And let's show just one more example of what we can do once the browser is hooked. We can actually use social engineering techniques to get target credentials. So if I go down here to social engineering, I can click on it and I can use something called pre-detect. So you can see all the other things that exist, fake flash update, fake notification bar, Google phishing, replace videos, Firefox extension, and all of that. But let's take a look at pre -detect. And this, if we read the description, asks the user for their username and password using a floating pop-up window. So let's take the dialog type to be Facebook, back in gray, and custom logo we will leave like this. So we won't change anything, but if you click on this, there are other options that you can choose from. For this example, we're just going to use Facebook. Let's click on execute. And if I go back to the target machine, here is the pop-up window. And this is actually something that you would end up sending them once they're on Facebook. So they actually think it's real. If they think they got logged out, they will type in their credentials. So let's say test at gmail.com and password is password123. Just an example. And let's click on login. Nothing will happen here, but if we go back to our Cal Linux machine under the command three, we can see the data that the target has inputted. The test has username or test at gmail.com and the password is password123. How cool is that?
And this is just tip of the iceberg of all the possible things that we can do. So next time that you receive an email or a message with a link, think twice before actually opening that link. Because all the target had to do is open the link and nothing else. Just load the web page. Alright, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next lecture.